The story starts with Kiriyama. Having moved out of his adoptive home into a bare-bones apartment, using the money he has been earning from his shogi career, he finds himself in a space of a lot of uncertainties. Not only does the loss of his family and his childhood self haunt him, but he also tries to re-enter school to at least get a sense of normalcy back into his life. A normalcy he deems necessary for having such an unusual life, a desire to be like any boy growing up at his age. This is sadly not as he had liked, and his isolated existence within a school continues on as it did when he went to school as a young boy. Not even among the shogi circles has he made any connections to peers his age yet. Luckily, there are people older than him who make the extra effort to show him some recognition and compassion. Like his teacher who visits him when Kiriyama goes to eat lunch alone on the roof of the school. He needs this kind of extra support since his peers just ignore him or in the past downright reject him. In one of his greatest moments of weakness, after going out drinking with guys he knew from Shogi, they show him no compassion and leave him drunk on the streets. In a beautiful act of kindness, a woman named Akari finds him and takes him to her home to take care of his intoxication and helplessness. This way, he finds himself with a warm welcome in the Kawamoto family. Not only do they appreciate his kind character, but they also share a similar experience of loss in their family. This brings up conflicting feelings in Rei, because he had already existed in another family and had to witness how the nature of his being was a threat to them, which without even directly having to acknowledge it to his adoptive parents, he knew it would be better to leave. As such, he fears being taken in and welcomed into any other family environment. Comparing himself to a kaku, that destroys the eggs of a bird's nest to feed on what the adoptive parents provide instead of their original children. So one evening, after knowing them for a while and being invited to eat again, he was filled with doubts and wanted to politely decline. It would be too painful to realize he had been unwelcome like he was before, but to his shock, he had not been asked a favor. And of course, him being such a hurt and readily helpful boy, he is weak to both Akari's invitation and request. In this situation, his weakness and kindness are completely appropriate, since Akari is a compassionate, kind, strong woman, ready to help and not to take for granted his efforts. This is completely opposed to his relationship to his stepsister, who through her own hurt uses Kiriyama for all his kindness in insidious ways. She knows Rei is completely weak for her, both her beauty and the vulnerability she shows to him. But there is no equal treatment in this relationship. She instead just throws all kinds of worries onto him, like getting involved with a cruel older man like Goto, and feeding him every fear and doubt that face him in a shogi career. Feeding his feeling that he does not deserve to win over others, when this is the exact thing he desperately needs in his life which is to build his strengths and find a success, so he can take on the real pain of the loss that he'd experienced. Him being such an apathetic kind boy, he has compassion with the loss that older shogi players experience when he makes them feel defeat, even though he's in no way responsible for their feelings, because he's a young boy on the important path to follow his talent and ambition with full dedication. Kyoko knows Shogi is the only way forward for him, but she also knows how sensitive and caring Kiriyama is. And out of her jealousy of his skill, him thus being preferred by her father for that reason, chooses to make him her target for her suffering. In truth, the fault lies here with Kyoko's father, and not Kiriyama. As the older stepsister, she misplaces all her deep-seated agony and unmet needs that her father was not there for onto Kiriyama. Being the hurt person that he is, he cannot help but feel empathy and the desire to help her struggles with her father. He sees only too clearly how much she is suffering. 
and since he is also hurt, he is not able to resist her despite her unhealthy behavior, and lets her cross his boundaries both physically and emotionally, and can't help but give free rein to the snake who tries to snuff out his power. His need for physical contact of any kind is also direly unfulfilled, and he can't resist the rare warmth she provides to him. Both are incredibly unhealthy people, but Rei is the one on his path to healing his trauma and not exploiting other people, while she, though she is a victim of her father, is mainly focused on exploiting the kind-hearted Kiriyama. Deep down she clings to him though, and needs him to not let go, because he is there for her weakness. She reflects his hurt soul, but so he has to become strong and heal himself first if he's going to be of help at all. Like Momo realizes, Kyoko is a witch, who is not on a healing path, but abuses Kiriyama's good nature. Really though, she is a lost girl, who truly doesn't know what to do, and feels like Kiriyama is the only real support she has in her life. It is no wonder that she would fall into an obsessive love with Goto, who in a way mirrors her father, but makes the denial and neglect more directly obvious, and doesn't cloak it like her father does. I will go more into the father and mother of Kyoko later on. It is wonderful that Kiriyama is an example of a family that is on a healing path, so he doesn't stay trapped in his desire for human contact by looking towards it in his unhealthy relationship with his stepsister. Who knows how much she could have dragged him into her unhealthiness. Being completely vulnerable to her and not knowing an example of a more healthy family outside the one he lost. In the Kawamoto family, he is able to find that family he lost, and live with them in honesty and fairness, empathy and warmth. In this new environment, he does not have to fear his kindness being exploited, as much as Akari must be aware that he is weak to her wishes. Well, which man is not weak to Akari? Her aunt Mizaki definitely knows that as well. His main lifeline though is Shogi, the golden ticket as he calls it. To always be able to look forward to having someone sit in front of him and challenge his ability. Someone to always make him spark more curiosity about himself and others. Although he's not able to maintain a connection, he has the favor to become a target of another boy who is his complete opposite. Outgoing and eager to speak to others, Nikaido slides his way into Kiriyama's life or rather, into his post box, to declare him his nemesis and best friend in the shogi world. This is the exact bridge and connection to the social world of shogi that the held back Kiriyama needed, even though it was technically illegal. Of course, Kiriyama is super irritated and confused at Nikaido's behavior, but it is clear there is no bad intention behind this passionate boy. Nikaido only knows too well the struggle of improving and dedicating his life to Shogi, and out of what circumstances that would have to originate. However, the one to truly reflect something deeply within him that he encounters in the Shogi world is the heavenly master of the game, Soya, the child of God. Ray's injury leaves him with very few options. His extended family is not caring and divided, not giving a shred of empathy for what he is going through. But an old friend of his father is there to lend him what all the others should be there for. This generosity is a lifesaver for him, but it is not enough for him to flourish in the way that he would truly need. Nevertheless, he pursues the narrow path he is given to become an adoptive son and to become obsessed with Shogi. In a state like this, where the fragility of his personality and growth are undeniable and threatening him with incredible pain, he is left with a feeling of purposelessness, since Shogi wasn't really something he pursued because it was what he truly needed in his own life, but something that for him was the only option to hang on to a little shred of life he had left. To fulfill his childhood needs, he lies and takes on an identity that would enable him to feel any little sliver of love 
to nurture his growth. Even though his choice was more so a response to fulfill the unfulfilled dreams of his adoptive father. A father who lacked a realized dream in himself and needed his children to pursue them. It is no wonder that someone like Kiriyama, someone so thirsty and desperate for life, with such a deep hunger to feel the light of his life and have it shine again, would be a destabilizing force in a family built on denial of one's own dreams. Kiriyama is in a position of absolute uncompromising necessity to regain a sense of self back that he lost from his dramatic life. Even lacking a conscious purpose for winning, or playing shogi at all, he feels a deep pain when facing defeat. He cannot at all costs lose like he has lost in the past, and will do anything to survive. There is a beast inside him that is extremely hurt and in need of a cure, but also deeply uncertain of an existence of a cure at all. And would bite into the hand that feeds it, would it need to do so for survival? All this he does, while not being able to have a witness to how he truly feels, not being able to have a safe environment to express any of his overwhelming struggles. At least, until Hina comes along. Without him knowing it, this caring and courageous girl sees the tears running down his face as he fell asleep. She must know only too well how he feels, going through such a similar experience of loss and also lacking an environment to express this heartbreaking situation. One evening, she made up a silly excuse to retreat into isolation, and knowing how Hina doesn't want to be a burden and be followed by her older sister or a grandfather, they push the only one who can be there for her in such a moment. This isn't the last time this happens, and he pursues her like he's in a dire pursuit of his own heartbroken soul to make sure Hina will not be left alone and out of sight. Just like the full moon in the scene, Hina reflected back to Kiriyama something he feels deep inside him as well. In a beautifully tragic moment, Kiriyama witnesses the waterfall of her deep suffering, and while he is unable to express himself or do anything, he is able to just be present and at least have her not feel completely alone in her situation. Just like she had been a witness to him unknowingly, had her see his tears, he was able to do the same. This impacted him deeply, and he knew there was someone he wanted to protect at all costs. And so he does, being there for her disappointment with Takahashi, just being present for when she is going through a struggle herself. Hearing of her struggles in school with bullying set him on a course of wanting to help no matter what. Wanting to give back after he feels that having had her as a mirror to his own inner sadness had saved him from utter despairing loneliness. He felt the only thing that would count is to take action. When he once visited her, Rei had noticed how she started to glow, almost like the golden suns he brought with him. He heard how her bad situation in school had been mostly resolved. Him being so unaware of the ways he has been of help to her, felt like he disappointed her by not being able to be more active in her situation. To this she angrily replied with how stupid it is for not recognizing how incredibly helpful it was for her to have a witness in her crying and suffering. This woke him up to a really important lesson about emotions, that sometimes one doesn't have to do anything to fix the problem, but just be there to be a witness to the suffering. This for him is a great difficulty to understand, because he had never had someone to be able to express his suffering to and imagines that he would be an unbearable burden if he would disclose any of it. He also didn't understand this when he got very sick over New Year's, and Akari had to abduct him from his delusion that he's existing as a burden to his environment, just because he has moments of weakness. She showed him how he has people who care and want to at least make contact to not have him suffer entirely alone that he isn't merely a burden when he's not being strong and self-sustaining.
She says that her taking him in and caring for him also was of her benefit, since she usually would clean up alone on New Year's and after everyone fell asleep, cry by herself. His journey to build his own strength ultimately is the path most necessary to his healing process. And relating to others on a similar journey is most central focus of his curiosity. Barely paying attention to Shimada from afar, dismissing him as a real shogi opponent and only focusing on his potential matches with Goto and Soya, his defeat got him into a real depression of his path in shogi, shattering his arrogance into pieces like Nikaido asked of Shimada to do. This rift that was created through his shattered overconfidence made him look for alternative ways of living, doubting if he was up to the challenge anymore at all. But this doubt also finally led him to take other shogi players more seriously, and shyly hoping for an invitation to the shogi workshop he heard from where Nikaido and Shimada train and had learned together. He thought he had no need of this, being such a shogi prodigy, but his necessary defeat made him curious about his own flaws and curious about the insight of others. Shimada himself had a big match in front of him and had been in the shogi world for a long time, dedicating himself to it ever since his upbringing in his village, where mostly older people encouraged his talent, and which put such pressure on him he would endure stomach aches on all important crossroads of his career. Not having brought home a big title after so long also pains him. But he had a dream where he would have given up on Shogi for a more normal life. And he would continue to feel regret for not continuing his dream. To see the inner sun of his life rise. In a way, he feels like nothing human made belongs in that place he grew up in. I will talk more about Shimada Kai's story later on. After an exhausting important win, Kiriyama shyly inched closer to ask the question that would for the first time truly open the door of his interest in Shogi outside his private domain. And funnily enough, Shimada had the exact same thing in mind. Both came in at the right moment. Ray having opened the door to realize his nature as a student and not yet being the master he thought he was. And Shimada opening the door that he can be the master after having won such a hard battle. After Ray joins the workshop, he is forced to become more familiar with sharing his thoughts on his shogi ability. Which to himself had just been obvious and not ever needed to be communicated to the outside world. Shimada observes a very curious comment from Kiriyama, and invites him for more shogi, since he also has a benefit of being able to have such a peculiar student as Rei. He particularly is curious because he has heard the exact words about a move being described in a certain way, by none other than the master, Soya, the child of God. During the workshop, he gets into heated discussions about intricate details of Shogi, arguing over it even on the way home with Nikaido. But once they see a duck diving into the water and not resurfacing, they immediately switch on a much more important matter of figuring out what kind of duck it is, to know if it is safe or not. One can really endlessly argue over tiny details in a Shogi game, and really, this is so unnecessary because of the highly contextual nature of Shogi. And to chatter on in arguments is truly a misuse of words that would rather be focused on duck facts. He also joins a club in a school, a science club where he accidentally, magically, creates a wonderful perfume. And with his addition is changed into the Shogi Science Club, Shosai Club. At the end of this season, he feels himself aligned with many others, on the path of growing and developing strengths, 
as if on a train where they all are going together. Developing your strengths comes with a cost. Especially as you build success, you start to believe that all you are is strong, and that this is the only thing demanded of you. Strength no longer becomes a thing to develop to be able to stand on your own and being there for the weak, but for denying our own weakness. Such a front is a fragile one that reveals itself through its cracks, like Humakura, who seems to have lost with such composure, it kicks in a real big crack into a hotel wall in his private time over it. Goto is also someone who has such a front, but really, he's not just simply cruel and heartless. Hearing two guys who are not even close to a title match make fun of Shimada, where Rei and Nikaido almost lose their cool and want to speak against them, Goto shows up and defends Shimada from these hecklers. Later on he also shows this other side of him by how weak he is to Kyoko. And really, this seems like a reflection of his own wife, who is sick and suffering. Barely able to sleep when alone, he sleeps like an old baby with Kyoko by his side. On the path of healing, it is vital not to only develop one side of your personality. I think this is greatly shown in Yamazaki. He is someone who has a very strong exterior, although he seems to have hit the limit of his own youthful drive to dive deep into the battle of Shogi, like Kiriyama and Nikaido do. This isn't the only thing he develops in his life. He also spends time growing beautiful flowers, which he gifts to Nikaido after winning against him because Nikaido collapsed because of his illness and had ended up in the hospital. And he also raises pigeons, caring for them with such a tender heart. Ever since his grandfather showed him how to play shogi and how to raise pigeons, he became obsessed with both. One day, he had his pigeon named Silver fly away, and he worried about it so much. If it would return at all, if it was suffering and alone, it really affected him. Luckily for him, while continuing his dedication towards his garden. Like a silver reflection of the sun in the moon, silver comes back flying out of the sun into Yamazaki's hands. Promptly he gives silver great care, like he had just regained his own soul. For Kiriyama, this reflection seems to exist in Soya himself. A mysterious figure, a child of God, an enigmatic and quiet person. It almost seems like it is Kiriyama in the future, just because they look so similar. But it seems he reflects more of what has been in his past. The mysterious relationship to his painful history, full of unknown emotion that threaten to drag him into their darkness that he has yet to still endure in order to heal is reflected in this mystical Soya. I was thinking while watching the anime, if Soya represents a person who has healed. And at this point I am not sure and would have to read the manga. But I will limit myself on the contents of the anime, since that is the only thing I have ever seen of it. What I think Soya does reflect, either just symbolically or literally, is the injury Kiriyama feels. One way this is depicted is in the scene where he has wine spilled all over him. Covered like blood, it looks like a reflection of Kiriyama's self that has been deeply injured. On top of that, he also represents the disassociation from these emotions. The grey and colourless face and aloof attitude he presents to the world seems like a real angelic face that might just be the face of the devil, as Shimada says. Later on we learned that he's also partially deaf which explains his strange behavior. I think in a sense his relationship to Takanori has something of a father-son relationship. Him taking care of Soya so often got me thinking. The scene where Kiriyama and Soya get stranded because of a typhoon after their show match, where he lays in bed and Kiriyama is in contact with Takanori, and he tells him of his problems and shares his worries about him, indicate to me that he's someone who has a close relationship to Soya, and in some ways maybe feels guilty. I can't really speculate more on this, since I really need to read the manga for that.
But the meaning of Soya in Ray's life is clear. Clear as the water of truth he is being given by playing him in the show match. Usually Ray would be drinking a green tea and a lemon drink. But in this match, he drinks natural water. He feels like he's surrounded by the truth of what is happening. There is no divide of outside and inside. There is a pure embodiment of the reality of one's thought, emotion and experience. So true in comparison to the rest of the world that is mostly clouded in darkness, where only little pockets of authenticity exist in which real inside is spoken out loud between lone individuals. So truthful felt the game between Ray and Soya, that at school he would still hear the sound of the pieces over anything the teacher would say or the usual classroom commotion around him. This part of the story goes deep into a problem that I think we all face growing up in school, directly or indirectly. The suffocating environment when bullying takes place in one's class is depicted perfectly in this story. Everything is drowned in unconsciousness, and one doesn't even know where to begin to start clearing out all this lack of awareness that has sprawled like weeds in the classroom. Luckily, Hina managed to get support at home. Although Okari struggles to figure out what she should do in this situation, their grandfather assures Hina that she has done the right thing. She also gets support from Rei, and later on from Takahashi, who would spend time with her during her lunches, when she would be shunned and alone. He also did the genius move after the bully got jealous. It is only understandable that Hina would want to go for revenge, as she says to Kiriyama how she wants to do the same things they did to Chiho. She wants them to drown in their own poison, like that overflowing bucket. This reaction is a flickering light, shining on the reality of the emotion, and following it would only drain it, but not make it more conscious. Which in the end, she chooses to go for. She chooses for the clear reflection of the sky in the truth of this experience. Ultimately, this responsibility rests on the teacher, but she's clearly being haunted by emotions that just feel too similar to the despair, dragging her back into this black mist atmosphere that she had allowed to fester. When faced with emotions that you have not dealt with in your own life, a schooling environment that surfaces those becomes a living nightmare. As such, she became overpowered by the deep-seated inner despair of someone acting it out by bullying in her class. The bully lies to her mother that she had been a target of Hina, who is spreading false rumors, and this mother believes her without proof. This mother cannot even recognize the truth. She seems to be projecting outwardly like her daughter does, seeing herself the victim in all situations. The fact that her daughter lies to her is rooted in the fact that she herself has never cultivated and connected with her own honesty, has never learned how she lives a lie herself. After a long investigation and an innocent victim, the soul repeating theater of trauma manifests in the honesty she speaks to with the principal about her worries for the future and inability to care for it all, about her hopelessness in her situation originating in her family system, where she never had anyone listen to her in the way that the principal now does. He gives her a healthy dose of his own insights facing such emotion as she is forced to do, and it seems to lift the veil that suffocates the classroom, although the apologies are still not sincere. Hina's previous friends apologize to her, tell her how worried about speaking up they were. Really, this is just a tragic and realistic depiction of what a class like that feels like, and what kind of innocent victims it leaves behind. Chio had to move to a special school, 
where she learns that one can still manage to build up trust with others, starting with the most honest creatures on earth, anything besides a human, in the next step with older, more matured people, and then finally trying with people of one's own age. What I learned about this process is that it is useless to force it. You can only do it by the sincere desire of your own curiosity, and putting yourself into social situations generally doesn't leave a lasting positive impact that helps your growth. One has to start small to reach big stages of growth, but still aim for the sun, like the heavenly path insect does, even though it is infinitely tiny in comparison. In a position of despair, with both Chiho and the bully, one is so sick and tired of people and their denial and lies, that the only human contact that has any healing effect at all is where the real honesty and authenticity of someone reflects your experience. Anything else is usually just draining and exhausting. As much as it was heaven sent that Kiriyama was able to be adopted into another family after he had lost his own, and his extended family was completely useless, this family had its own share of deeply rooted problems. Although I don't know much of the backstory, and the story of the mother is only told in the last episode of the second season, one can still infer a lot of things that must have gone wrong in this family dynamic. The mother already starts out with saying how she is someone who didn't believe that people could live their own lives, and really, this is where the whole thing comes crumbling down. If people are stuck in a limited way of being, they surely will not be able to bring freedom into their own family. Her in the role of just being a mother at home, doing the same thing every day, is completely at odds with being able to express our truth and become whole and healed. Living in such self-denial often attracts others in a similar denial, and we can see this with the father as well. After adopting Kiriyama, who really seems to be there for the father's needs of wanting someone else to fulfill his shogi dream, rather than being there for the needs of Kiriyama or his own children, one can tell this man has not developed a mature relationship to himself as well. He forced his children on a path which had gotten destroyed by the talent of Kiriyama. The father not being honest with himself was not able to be honest with his children. He tells them after the frustrations in Shogi that Shogi isn't everything, but these words are useless from a father that is only able to truly empathize with someone who pursues Shogi to the extent that he tried to. His children know that they are a disappointment to him for not being as good at Shogi because they were forced to adopt a personality that involves Shogi in their life to get their childhood needs met. The love and empathy they need to be nurtured into grown people with their own strengths. Deep down they knew this was everything and was the unlived life of their father, to whose needs they had to appeal to because he never had gotten his own as a child, and never met his own after he became an adult. As a result, his children sank into despair. When someone came along with such a hunger for life because of his own loss, who then got in the way of that last sliver of nurturing their father was able to give. A father who couldn't even be there when his son hit such a pit of hopelessness that he said in the rebellion that being able to make an effort itself is a talent. And his father in shock was only able to laugh awkwardly not able to receive at all these emotions that probably were slumbering in his own unconscious, which he was never able to face. In such a family, Kiriyama is a real wake-up call, since his drive to become real and alive disturbed their collective denial, and so he moved out. After he visited his stepmother at the end of the anime, she then had a little dream of a Kiriyama who is a real son and a little rebel indulging like her other children. As seems after this episode of a reflective journey, one has to ask if this is a sign of that little rebel in her that finally can grow into a way of living that respects the whole being of her personality and allows her to live an authentic, true life of her own.
I didn't expect to go into detail about Saku after writing out my previous thoughts, but I remember vividly how much he made an impression on me the first time I watched this anime. Him stepping into the fiery waters has been an image that I feel hardly any other story depicts so consciously. The important subject of this deep dive into the mentality of this character speaks to me in a very serious manner, because the topic at hand is not just of growing old and seeing his, all his friends leave him behind, but it centrally is the topic of conscious suffering. Now I don't mean that in any masochistic kind of way, but in the way where the conscious approach to one's pain actually awakens to the meaning of it, and is the way out of unconscious sadistic or masochistic habits. To be a human torch is to understand that the emotions that follow us all our life are unavoidable, and to live in a delusion of being able to escape them is, truly, to die too early, to not go for the ultimate prize of regaining your soul after we had been painfully ripped apart from it. This allows us to truly continue on in life, to follow and fulfill our dreams, become strong and mature, despite one's age still young and full of energy. This energy really is stored in the painful memories of our upbringing. Underneath that is the real strength that carries us through the dry land and allows the water of the river of our life to continue existing and soothe the existence of being in a burning field. Our buried emotions unveiled in the course of our lives are able to carry our journey to the end. Yet it is so rare that this happens in most people's lives and often they watch us going on as we continue and hang onto our path which can feel like burdening wishes sashes like Saku carries all over his body. But also, such connections keep one moving forward, give courage despite being on the path alone. To sink into your depths at such an age, to fulfill your own legacy, is to me what Saku's story conveys as it has been told in this anime so far. Just like Sako as the human torch, Shimada Kai is on the path of learning the meaning of his pain too. Kai's dream, where he has not gone pro and settled down with his girlfriend he broke up with five years ago, where they had a daughter and lived back in the village, where the elders that cheered him on showed him that they really aren't disappointed with him not going pro, would have seemed like a happy ending. Yet, within his dream and in waking life, He's still haunted by his stomach aches, living in regret because he had not committed to going pro. The trauma that showed itself in his pain would have continued on, even in such a commonly idealized dream of settling down and having a family. In truth, it would have meant his death. It would have meant him giving up on his path to healing and putting his hopes and responsibilities elsewhere, forced to live in denial of his own pain. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Kai's story continues in the manga.